Hello, humans. Um, so I started school. Oh, wait. I haven't started yet, and now it's working. So I started school in 1995, now you can guess my age, and I actually recreated the haircut for you. So <laughs> I started school in 1995, and this is me on my first day of school. And there's a German tradition where kids receive a Schultüte, which kind of translates to school cone on their first day of school. And it contains all the stuff that they need for their first days of school. And usually they only get one but I got really lucky because my parents were separated, so I got two. And you can see here the pink one, that's the one that I got for my dad, and it contained all things candy. And then the other one that was self-made was for my mom, and it contained things like a pencil sharpener and an eraser. So apparently they had very different ideas of what you need for your education. Um, and I'm glad they did have different ideas about this, because when it was time to learn the correct spelling and the correct grammar, I really needed that eraser, but I also really needed the candy in order to get through that time. <laughs> so this perspective that different opinions about stuff are, can be equally valuable, it kind of stuck with me. And so this is what I want to talk to you about. It's going to be about differences and how those relate to diversity. And we're going to look at one model that's called the margin and center model. And then I want to talk to you about how we can actually make diversity sustainable. And there's going to be a conclusion like there has to be. So, I want to take this to a workplace setting. Um, your workplace setting, preferably. I want you to imagine that you have an idea for a feature that goes to the app that your company is building. Now, I want to see a show of hands. Who would take that idea and go to someone from IT in order to discuss it? OK, that's not so many. Who would take that idea and go to someone from, say, marketing in order to discuss the idea? That's also not so many. Interesting. So I assume that you would talk to someone from your company. Would you maybe rather see if you could build some form of prototype and give it to a user and see how they react? OK, that's a few more. Awesome. Now, I would like to see two more questions. Um, I would like to know who here could maybe tell me the technical complexity of the feature that you're thinking of. One, two, three, four. OK, that's a few. And who could tell me the probable financial cost to implement that feature? OK. So these are not random questions, of course. <laughs> Duh. I asked them because I wanted to point out a, spe a few specific differences. And the first, or actually the last question that I asked you about, is about what kind of information do you hold? Do you know about technical um, difficulty, or do you more know about the financial cost of something? That's different information that we hold. And funnily enough, people who are very similar think that they hold the same information. So when they need to solve a problem together, they don't communicate that much. They kind of think that, OK, so we know all the same things. We're probably going to agree on the same things, and there's not going to be any tough decisions. Whereas studies show when you have teams with diverse people on the team, um, they don't think that they know the same things that the other people know. So they talk a lot more. They communicate more. They share more of their information. Also, they think that different opinions are going to happen. And they think that they will need to work hard to get a consensus within the team so they prepare better for meetings. Um, and I think that's really the approach you want to take for a team. If they need to decide on something, they should decide on it together, but before they need to talk about how they and why they want to decide on something. So that's the one about information. Then the first question I asked you about was about perspectives, whether you ask a person from IT or whether you ask a person from marketing. Uh, perspectives inform us about like what we think is next to each other, how we draw metaphors between the problems that we want to solve. 
And if you go to the IT person, they will probably give you a very different input from going to the marketing person. They will give you some very other input. And you'll have two different or even more different solutions to choose from in the end. And then finally, the question in the method, uh, in, in the middle, was about methods or about so-called heuristics. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly in English. In German, it's heuristic. But anyways, so heuristics don't create solutions right away. They are the methods we use in order to solve a problem. So when you go ask an expert about their opinion, that's one way to solve a problem. But doing the trial and error thing, building something, seeing how a user reacts, would be another way to solve the problem. And ideally, we would combine these two. And we do an A-B test and see which one works better. But first, we ask experts what they think we should start off with, right? So, in the keynote yesterday, uh, Jess, in, in the morning keynote yesterday, Jessica Kerr showed us a lot of great images, and one of them was how you need an open mind in order to have um, better problem solving and in order to get towards that creativity part when you want to get there. And Scott E. Page actually created a mathematical model on how the combination of perspectives and information in the end, generate even more creativity and innovation. Now, I've told you about my school experiences a little bit, and I've had a few really bad experiences with standing in front of an audience and explaining math formulas. So I'm not going to recreate this, <laughs> but I have put up some references here so you can check out the research yourself. The gist of uh, Scott E. Page's work is that if you combine different information perspectives and heuristics, you will get an effect that's called super additivity, and you'll get a lot more creativity and innovation out of teams. Now, so far, I've only spoken about differences. I have not spoken about diversity. Differences simply mean that one thing is not the same as the other. Diversity, however, relates to very specific categories. So, ah, that one direction works. Good. Uh, so differences relate, uh, diversity relates to differences in socially constructed categories, but they feel and appear very real, such as race, gender identity, class, disability, gender expression, sexual orientation, religion, and ethnicity. You might have differences already within socially homogenous teams, but you'll create a larger variety when you have socially diverse teams. Because what these categories do is they shape different realities of life. People from different social categories grow up differently, whether we want to or not. So I've talked a little bit, and I've struggled a little bit with the tech, and I promise that this is going to be an interactive talk. Um, I'm not going to make you talk to the person right next to you. What I will usually ask people at this point is to take out a piece of paper and a pen. How many people brought this? Okay, awesome, that's a few. Everyone else can also participate, because I was expecting this. This is a tech conference. Um, you probably have some other tool to take all of your notes, or you have the brain. That sometimes works. Um, so, if you have pen and paper, take out pen and paper. If you don't have pen and paper, just take your palm and take a finger, and I'm going to ask you to draw something. So, you're going to have to be very attentive to what you're drawing onto your palm, okay? I'm asking you to draw a cat, because this is the kitten, kitten track. Um, I'm asking you to draw a cat. It doesn't need to be very accurate. It also, like, if it's just some animal with four legs, that's totally fine. I'm not big in drawing either. I'm going to show that to you in a minute. Um, we're all going to draw a cat. I will also do it on there. And when I'm done, I'm going to check in with you. And after that, we'll continue. So I'm going to go to the drawing board. You go to your palms and draw a cat. Are you drawing? Yes.
Okay, so my drawing is not the best. I will share it with you in a minute. Um, I brought a few other cats that I also drew, and like I said, I'm not the best drawing person. You're definitely allowed to mock them and to laugh about them. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you one cat after the other, and if you feel like that cat is similar to the one that you drew, just stand up if you're able, okay? And then after I switch to the next cat, you can sit down again. So, who drew a cat from the top? Who drew a cat from the bottom? <laughs> Nobody. Who drew the cat from the back? One person, okay. That's easy, right? Who drew the cat from the front? And I actually mean the entire body, not just the face. That's a few people, okay, that's quite a few people. Who drew the cat looking to the right? Also a few. And who drew it looking to the left? Yeah. That's me too. So I'm going to share this very beautiful kitten. There you go. <laughs> I put a little bit more work into those. <laughs> um, but I also had something that I could draw through. So anyways, the cat exists in three dimensions. And most of you have seen it from many angles. I would say maybe not from all of these. Um, but I've asked you to put it into two dimensions, and most of you have chosen a specific perspective. And I do these exercises quite a lot, and usually most people draw it looking to the left, but, like, yeah, you're a bit more creative. I like that. So why do we draw cats in perspectives, in specific perspectives? We've learned to see and we've learned to recreate things from a certain angle. And this goes for cats, but it also goes for other things. Most importantly, we've learned to view some things as the norm, some perspectives as the norm, like usually it's the cat looking to the left. And we tend to forget that, forget that there are other perspectives too. I'd like to introduce you now to a model that I first learned from reading Bell Hooks and Grada Quilomba. They're also in the references if you want to look them up. And this is a model about margin and center, but it's not about cats, it's about real humans. So I want you to imagine a group of people in this circle. They live in good neighborhoods, they have good jobs, their kids receive the best education, or at least an okay education. Um, to them, their life is just a life. They live it. It's the default. They don't think that they're privileged or that they have a better life than other people. It's just the life that one lives. Their life is also represented in books, in movies, in politics. Their life is not, their reality is not a reality. It's just reality. It's the position in which you draw the cat looking to the left without even thinking about the fact that it could be drawn any other way. Now, I want you to imagine a different group of people in the second circle now. They mostly read the same books than the center people. They live in the same political system than the center people, and they receive the same education than the center people. However, their life realities are a little bit different, but those are not represented in books, media, or politics. Maybe it's the position in which you have usually, you usually have your cat sitting on your lap, so it'd be much easier to draw it from the top, but you still draw it looking to the left because that's what's expected. But this was not supposed to be about cats, it was supposed to be about humans. So, the center margin theorem, it kind of manifests itself in our society, and it manifests itself in different levels of society, and I'm going to talk about three different levels now. It's going to be about culture, institutions, and individuals, and we can't dig very deeply into each of them, so only brought small examples for each of these. Um, and I would like to start with the culture part. I need you to all stand up if you're able, please. Please. 
thank you. Um, I'm going to tell you a few names, and if you feel that you know who that person is, you keep standing. And if you feel you don't know who that person is, you have a seat and you stay seated. Okay? Ada Lovelace. Grace Hopper. Yes. Dorothy Vaughn. Yes. Evelyn Boyd Granville. Yes. Audrey Tang. Okay. That's a few people still standing. Everyone else is also awesome, but this is very awesome. <laughs> Thank you, you may have a seat. The first computer programmer, the inventor of the compiler, the person, the, the um, human computer who taught NASA how to code with Fortran, the expert on digital stuff for the Apollo space mission, and a Perl programmer who's now advising the Taiwanese government on digital issues. That's the names of the people, and that's their faces. Margin and center in our cultural level matter because it's about the stories that we tell and the stories that we know, and who gets to tell their stories, and who listens when those stories are told. And it's not just about real humans. It's also about fictional stories. This is a film still from Hackers, the movie, and the other one is easy because it says right there, Matrix. So these stories, they're not about Nikon or Morpheus. They're not about Kate or Trinity. They're side characters. They exist, they move the story along, but the story ultimately is not theirs. We can also see that in how they are positioned in the pictures and how the lighting is set so that they can actually be visible, right? Um, and then, of course, it's also about what stories does the media highlight in order to show who the tech heroes are. There's also a cover of Sheryl Sandberg, but that's basically all I could find, one white woman. <coughs> so. Culture is about the stories that we tell. Now we're going to move on to another level, to the institutional level in society. So institutions are about rules, about laws, and about how we do things usually. And I hope this is an example that you don't already know. Um, so in the 1950s and 60s, it was very en vogue to objectively determine if someone was fit for a job. And how companies did that was by personality profiles and aptitude tests. So IBM developed one for filling their programming positions. And they thought, they figured out that people who are programmers should be good at math. They're kind of the lone genius type, and they're a little bit antisocial. Because apparently, that's what makes you build great software, software for other humans, right? So, in 1957, there was already scientific criticism about this perspective. There was a scientific paper that showed that there is no statistically significant correlation between how people do on this test and how their job performance reviews turn out. But the industry didn't care. So by 1960, an estimated 80% of all businesses used aptitude testing and half of them used the IBM programming aptitude test. Because, hey, who needs science? So this is a very old test, but do you recognize the stereotype about who belongs into the center of IT and who belongs to the margins? Ah, whatever. So for the last one, um, I'm going to talk about the individual level, and the individual level is what people experience in their day-to-day -day interactions. Um, who here, show of hands, has ever heard about the stereotype that women talk too much? Who here actually believes it? Okay. So there's an interesting Australian study um, that showed that men think a conversation is equal if women talk 15, that's one five, 15 percent of the time. If women talk 30 percent of the time, 
they believe women are dominating the conversation. It's an unconscious bias, it's not your fault, but it's something that you can look at again and again when you notice that. What behavior does this introduce into people? Well, men tend to interrupt women a lot more than they interrupt each other. Men's opinion become the center, whereas women's opinion and voices are pushed towards the margins. So these were just a few examples of how the margin center theorem works. And why does it matter? It matters because the center shapes everyone's view of reality. As a woman, I know what it feels like to have my opinion pushed towards the margins. But as a white person, I also know that another part of my identity has always been in the center. So the word for that, by the way, is intersectionality. I encourage you to look that one up, too. There's no time for it, unfortunately, now. Um, so what does it do when we have one perspective that shapes everyone's reality? Well, we make really shitty decisions. <laughs> like, we have... In 2015, there was Apple that forgot to introduce a period tracking option in their health kit, right? In 2016, um, the algorithm that determined where to implement Amazon's same-day delivery service largely excluded black neighborhoods. And then there was Microsoft's Twitter bot Tay, which I don't, probably don't need to remind you of. That's shitty decisions. But other things happen too. Potentially really harmful things happen. I'm going to go back a little bit in time. When the first airbags came out, a disproportional amount of women and children died from the airbags, because the crash test dummy was engineered to the size and weight of the man on the team, of the men in the engineering team. But women and children are usually smaller, and they can't handle the same impact. So they died. Voice recognition software still performs worse on women and people who have accents. Yet, we continue to build tools that are voice activated and even more security stuff that needs to be able to listen to humans' voices, right? And then risk assessment algorithms for the US uh, judicial system that are supposed to help judges to see who should be incarcerated for how long help incarcerate black men even with even harder sentencing, and that contributes to the continuation of racism in the judicial system. So that's the harmful decisions here. So how do we change the manifestation of a system that systematically hurts marginalized people? I'm going to go back a little bit to my own story. So I took this different perspectives thing really seriously. Um, I have a BA in anthropology, and I also have a bachelor in science in computer science. And that happened because when I studied anthropology, I worked in QA in different IT startups. And when I wanted to write my thesis, I didn't want to write about those other people in those other countries and the other things that they do. I wanted to study a culture that I'm part of. So I studied IT culture, and I studied specifically how women create their own spaces in IT. Um, and during my research, I stumbled upon a study program that was computer science, but for women only. Now, I know that in the United States, there is a tradition of women-only colleges and of black colleges and of black women colleges. But in Germany, that really doesn't exist. We have five programs on, in the entire country that are for women only. Um, so I was really intrigued by this. I was like, why are they doing this? Well, I can tell you that in the questions if you're interested. But <laughs> I had always done stuff with, with my computer. I would find music on the internet and build my own playlists and burn the CDs and design the covers and have Laura's hits one through 52, I guess. Um, 
I would build my own Harry Potter fan website. And I would always do stuff on the computer. I called it computering. I was not afraid of the computer, but I did not see that this could be a potential thing that I could study, because I was so afraid of the math. Hello, math teacher. <laughs> so when I saw that program, I was like, I should really give myself the chance to do this. So I applied, and I got in, and I studied computer science only with women. But just to see if there really was a difference between my program and the normal co-educational program, I also took a class in the co-educational program. We were actually encouraged to do so if we wanted to. Um, and wow, there was a difference. So in the co-educational class that I took, it was about algorithms and data structures. And I think there were about five women in the class and 30 men. And on the first day, the professor talked about stuff. Um, and there was one thing where I wasn't entirely sure if I really understood. So I raised my hand, and he picked me, and I asked my question. And before I could actually like, draw my breath, everyone's faces were turning towards me. And they're like, oh, a person is speaking. And then they're like, oh, it's a woman. Nobody jumped. <laughs> but they were, everyone was staring at me. And luckily, it was a smart question, because I had understood correctly. I just wasn't entirely sure. So, but in that moment, I kind of got this weird gut feeling that I could not ask the stupid questions. I had that feeling that I could not fail this class because all eyes were already on me. I did not have that feeling in the women's only classes. And that's not because women are more social or, you know, the classes were easier or whatever. It's just because I was not singled out because of my gender. So, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, yes. You probably, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. You probably <laughs> know that comic, right, XKCD? They put it to the point. This one's about tokenism. So, that weird gut feeling that I had in my stomach, there's actually social and psychological sciences that back me up here. Um, Diversity is not about like adding one diverse face to the team. That's called tokenism. And tokenism is also a psychological effect where people will generalize a part of someone's identity if it makes up less than a third of the group. So going back to my example, I was one out of five women and 30 other men, so we, the, the gender part was definitely underrepresented. So whatever I would do would not be perceived as, that's what Laura does. It would be perceived as, that's what women do. Whenever I would fail or ask the stupid question, it would not be the stupid question that Laura asked. It would be the questions that women ask. And I knew that subconsciously, and everyone in that class only realized that subconsciously, so they didn't really realize it. And imagine learning programming with that kind of weight on your shoulders. It just makes it really hard. So I applaud all the people who went through the co-educational classes. <coughs> Why am I telling you this story? Because having only a small amount of marginalized people on the team, no matter the motivation behind it, will not change the power dynamics within the team. Diversity needs to be more than tokenism. It needs to be about inclusion. That's how we call it today. Or, if I'm quoting Martin Luther King, he used the term integration back then. When I speak of integration, I don't mean a romantic mixing of colors. I mean real sharing of power and responsibility. <clears throat> so, you might feel that you don't actually have any power, because that's a weird concept to most of us. But you do have influence, and most of all, you have influence on your own actions. So this is where you could start. I'm going to give you a few suggestions, some of the stuff that I've done, some of the stuff that I wish other people had done. So you can start with the self. 
with your actions and your influence on your own actions. You could, for example, da, no, <laughs> self first. You could, for example, start reading only books by women of color for an entire year. I only read books by women and people of color for an entire year, and I learned about so many different realities of life. It was amazing. And there's also science fiction by women of color, by the way, if you're into the sci-fi. Um, what else could you do? You could educate yourself about microaggressions. Does everyone know what microaggressions are? A few people. So microaggressions are the small day-to-day -day interactions that kind of manifest who's in center and who's expected to be on the margins. You also have influence within your family or within the circle, closer circle of your friends. So what could you do there? One of the hardest parts is pointing out when someone that you love is manifesting their own center position. This goes for dinner conversations also. And it's really hard. But if you don't do it, who else is supposed to tell them? And to whom are they supposed to listen, if not the person who loves them? You could also choose to take over the unloved tasks in the household, like remembering what's in the fridge and what needs to be shopped for, or taking your kid to that dentist appointment and also making that dentist appointment. Because care work is what marginalized people do so much more of. Now we're taking it a little broader even, and we're going to look at the workplace context. What can you do there? Well, you can help and suggest or even implement a proper hiring process and not one like the IBM PAT. Implement one that sets smart standards and sets them before you actually judge CVs and so on. There's a lot of literature about how to do proper diversity hiring or let's just say human hiring, okay? <laughs> what you could also do is you pass on that speaker request to a colleague, but don't just leave it there. Help them prepare the slides, help them prepare, help them try the presentation in front of you. But most of all, help them find some kind of compensation for their work, because marginalized people don't get paid for all the extra work that they have to do. Finally, this one's the public sphere. You I think that's the one where most of us believe we don't have any influence because we're also disappointed with politics. But you do have influence in the public sphere too. Let's take Twitter. Once, whenever you want to retreat something by a straight white man, go look for something smart that a marginalized person has said and retreat that one instead. Or, you know, more generally, promote, vote for, and recommend the people whose perspective has been placed on the margins for way too long. So, we're slowly coming to a conclusion, and I'm going to drink some more water. Because self-care. I've talked to you about differences and the positive effects that difference can have, and how much more differences we can have when we actually have different social categories. The variety that all of us bring in. I've shown you how the center margin still continues to manifest itself in our society. We've looked at different levels, right? And I've shown you a little bit where your influence is and where you can change that system. And personally, it's been really hard for me to tell you that diversity is a business advantage. Not because of the data, because the data shows that diverse teams perform better financially, they are so much more creative, they have so much more innovation, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but for me, people are not resources to be exploited by capitalism. So, for me, it's much easier to tell you that diversity is simply the right thing to do. It's what we need to do in order to create a more just society. However, either of these approaches are absolutely useless 
if we don't learn to see and understand the margin and center dynamics within diverse teams. Diversity alone does not remove power dynamics. We have to move towards a sustainable version of diversity that's aware of the margin and center perspectives. And then, only then, can diversity also be a tool for empowerment. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura. There was just a question flying in here while I stepped on the stage, so I will bring it. <coughs> Do you think the move to introduce programming in elementary schools will have an effect on the number of women programmers? Why or why not? That's a good question. I think it can help, and I think we need a lot of different strategies in order to create a larger pipeline of women in programming. Um, but it's not so much about teaching programming in general, it's about how you teach it. And there's a lot of great teachers and there's also teachers who don't really know how to explain programming. So there's a few studies that show even if you teach programming, the teachers will spend more time with the boys so that the boys get more, get to try out more and they get all the tips first and girls tend to go back. That starts like in the teenage years. Earlier, there's more uh, equality in the learning part. Um, so yes, teaching does help, but it's not the only way we can fix the problem. So we need to approach it from many different angles. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Yes. All right. You need to hand it back, please. Hello. Uh, I cannot sit down. Oh, it's, oh, it's cool. Okay. So I come from Colombia, and uh, I have a bachelor as a uh, software engineer. Can you move the? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I come from Colombia, and I have a bachelor as a software engineer, and uh, there, and then I took my masters uh, in uh, also software engineering in Denmark. Right. Mm -hmm. In Colombia, we were sixty percent uh, men, men, and. 40% women, so it was quite 50-50, right? Close, uh, close enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then it was quite shocking for me when I come to a class and uh, we were only two women, yeah. uh, which uh, two of us, we, I'm from, was me from Colombia and my friend from uh, Argentina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually, I don't think it's about um, education. I think it's a, a bit more of a, a cultural thing. Yes, very and um, much. it's more about the openness and uh, how and what do you need to be because um, in our countries at that time, for instance, being a software engineer is a, was a, a, an income, and then doesn't matter if you're a man or your man, a woman. You have to because you want to get some money. So how the question is how could you, for instance, see this case that come from from America? Um, put it here in, in, in Europe because uh, uh, I guess I see Europe is more like being more close, more, more, more men, RIT. And so this is definitely about culture. So there's uh, studies that show that in India, for example, and also in Turkey, women are much more likely to simply go into IT and do very well there. Um, and thank you for that example too. Um, and yes, it's uh, a European slash US American problem, definitely, but also in those cultures, it hasn't always been the same. And I think we've heard this at that conference already, that programming used to be a woman's job, but it also used to be secretarial work. It used to perceive, be perceived as something that's not so valuable. And that changed once computers were no longer built for only universities and the military, but the personal computer came along and there was actually money in the industry. And once there's mon money in the industry, men are more likely to also go there. And that's when the women were pushed out, so that was in the 80s. And we can, we can see that cultural change here um, in, in Europe and in the United States. And so I forgot your question. Was that answering your question? <laughs> what the hell is happening, yes. 
Yeah, so it's a lot about whom do we perceive as biologically, technically capable, and that's men. And that's a, a, a terrible stereotype. And I showed you what I showed you the IBM programming test, and that's one of this, those cases that kind of shaped who is supposed to be a programmer and who isn't. And there are many other examples, and we kind of reproduce this. Um, and I think we need to solve it on different levels too, because it's being recreated on different levels. So having more role models, um, talking about those stereotypes, and so on. That's all we need to do. Okay, you go ahead. Hey, so uh, I want to apologize from the beginning because I think I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. <laughs> You're not? I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> first of all, uh, yes, I think diversity d really does create uh, or inspires uh, more creativity. Mm -hmm. But uh, we shouldn't forget that both this uh, divide and conquer sentence, and I think this divide and conquer the origin of that is why can we, I mean, you said something like uh, capitalism and defending people from capitalism. I think you can uh, be powerful if you're united. And what unites us is what we have common. If we are very different from each other, I think we will be very divided from each other. So, so that's one thing. And uh, I, I'm just saying maybe that's more about how we think than just how we are, I mean, color and whatever. So divide and conquer as in colonialism, or what's your perspective there? No, but I mean divide and conquer. This is like if so you want to. So because I think I think like going somewhere and making that your own is not something that works well for the people who've already been there. I don't what understand. Do you mean? Yeah, divide and conquer is like so. I'm gonna make sure these people are gonna start fighting against each other so that I can create yes. a better position on top of their... Correct. This is what I'm saying. That they start fighting each other because they're different, okay. not yeah. because they're all the same. <laughs> and someone oh, is exploiting okay. the fact that they're different. See? That's... <laughs> so you think it's a, it's a good strategy to point out differences between people? Yes, I think uh, pointing out differences is how you divide a society. Oh, okay. Oh, now I get your point. So you think pointing out that people have different income and people have different realities of life and people have different access to power and influence creates more divide. Because I actually think once I start pointing out the problem, we can solve it if we don't even talk about the problem. And the problem is that people have very different chances in our society. When we don't talk about that, we can't solve it. The ideal is that we all have the same access and the same political influence. That's the ideal that we might want to achieve, but we're not there yet. So we need to look at the situation now and we need to discuss it. But and there are, dif there are differences. There are also a lot of stuff that unites us and that's important to point out. But if we don't see the differences in no, what... I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just saying that if you take 100 different people and put them all together in one, I think they're not going to be very united in, in fighting a common goal because they don't actually have a common goal. They all have, they want different things. Well, if that's I humans like football, in general. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but if we have a team that wants to solve one specific problem, okay. that's the thing that uni unites them. They together want to solve a problem. That's what unites them. They have, different, they have different approaches to doing so, and they need to understand that all of them are equally valuable. But the thing that unites them is not their skin color or whatever, it's that they want to solve a problem. I think you can discuss this over coffee. <laughs> I think that's, that's a very passionate topic, so um, you can discuss this over coffee or another beverage. Is there another question? Like question, question. Um, you said during your speech that um, we could ask in the end uh, why you had this uh, girls only class mm -hmm. in computer science. Why I chose it or why it exists? Why it exists. So it exists because the German numbers say or show that women who start co um, studying computer science drop out really quickly. And the reason is not that they are not capable, it's that they don't feel comfortable studying there. And 
I don't believe that we need to segregate society into different sections so that each can be all on their own. But what we need to create is an environment where people can focus on the learning and don't need to focus on all of the stereotypes that are raining down on them. So the solution for that in this case was we're going to separate, well, no, actually they didn't separate the existing classes, they offered an extra program where women could apply. And funnily enough, um, in the old program it was still the same amount of women that applied, but a lot of people who would not have applied before applied for that women's program. And what they can see now, so it's only a bachelor's program, what they can see now is that a lot more women are applying for the master's program, and they do really well in the master's program. So it, it was a good strategy in order to create a learning environment that actually helps people to just learn. And I apologize for using a lot of examples with women. That's because I am one. But there are a lot of different social categories that we need to consider too, right? Okay. I have actually one question. Go ahead. I was asked yesterday, and um, I have my answer to that, but I want to have your answer. Where do I start if my company is not diverse at all? Don't just hire one diverse face. <laughs> That's what I can tell you to not do. I think it actually makes sense to not go straight into the hiring process, but to help people learn about their own positions first. And there's a lot of anti-bias trainings, and I don't mean diversity trainings because they're usually a bit weird. I mean real either social justice or anti-bias trainings where people learn about what's their position in society and how it profits them and how also it fails them sometimes. And like I also said in the talk, we got to start with ourselves before we can try to, you know, fix the rest. Right. Did you have a question? No? Okay. Then thank you very much for joining this talk and have a nice break. Thanks.